Good morning. It's good to have you in worship this morning. Uh, it's good to have some visitors. Uh, we do appreciate the fresh flowers. Uh, we appreciate the Parker family allowing us to use some of those in, uh, in the building. And so appreciate that. Um, as uh, many of you probably have heard, uh, Berlene Parker, uh, her funeral was Friday. And uh, so continue to lift up the Parker family in prayer this morning. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Allen, who is the chairperson of the uh, Pastor Church Committee. He is going to come and just give you a little update on what uh, they've been doing, what they're up to, and what's going to happen. Well, while Dr. Allen is making his way up here, we have a, something that we want to do really quickly right before he starts. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Chairperson Anthony Allen, uh, Vice Chair Bobby Parker, please stand when we call your name, uh, Bill Bouye, Stephanie Conrad, Joyce Davis, Steve Laws, and Jenny Valick, and alternate was Bob Klein. So let's uh, uh, thank these people, give them a hand for serving today. For uh, each week we will try to give you at least an announcement in the bulletin, letting you know what we're doing and the progress that we're making. I'm very pleased with the progress we've made so far. This week will be our third week meeting, and we have a lot of work to do as a committee to get together our church profile, our community profile, our pastoral profile, make a, announcements, uh, complete the application, all those necessary things you have to do to begin launching the process. But I want to just encourage each of you as we take this responsibility very seriously, uh, you'd also be in very much prayer for us as we uh, fulfill this task here at the church. Uh, in the coming days, you're going to be receiving some information, a survey, and we want to get your input to, uh, uh, on uh, how we should be proceeding, any ideas that you have, some people you might like, like to recommend. So you will be getting a church survey. We're also going to be conducting some small group listening sessions because we want to hear your heart and we want to make sure each of you have an opportunity to give input on the process and the candidate we're going to be searching for. So uh, please be in prayer for our committee. Thank you for this opportunity. We look forward to updating you on a weekly basis. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Allen. Uh, let's uh, stand together and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do come before you, God. You are an awesome and mighty God. And, Lord, we, uh, we lift up the, the dear family in our church, the Parker family, and their, uh, their extended family, uh, Lord, in the loss of uh, their loved one, Berlin. And, uh, Lord, we lift our church up to you, God. What a, what a hole we'll, we'll see there. And, God, uh, we just uh, thank you for her life, and we thank you for the family. And, God, we just ask that you to continue to strengthen them and give them courage in the coming weeks. Uh, Father, we lift up our uh, search committee to you, uh, God, and, and Lord, the, the man that you've already selected to be our next pastor. And Lord, we just pray that we would be open to your guidance as we go through that process and uh, get to that point where we call a new pastor. Father, you are good to us. And Lord, as we sing of your love for us, your mercy for us, your grace, Lord, that you gave your son so that we might have freedom from sin. God, we thank you for that. And God, we praise you in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. Be strong in the Lord. Be of good courage. Rejoice. The victory is yours.
we have a way of salvation if we follow him, if we accept him as Lord and Savior, turn from our sins and turn to you. Oh God, we thank you for grace through the Son of Jesus, through his blood. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus gives us freedom from sin if we follow him. Scripture, all right? And then I'm going to make some arguments 
about what freedom ought to look like in the life of a Christian. All right, and then hopefully we'll be able to make some applications. So the main point on your sheet is this. The more we understand about genuine freedom, the greater we treasure it. Okay, the more we understand about genuine freedom, the greater we treasure it. Now, freedom is something to be treasured. Freedom is something to be held on to tightly. Freedom is, is something that many in the world covet. They desire. Uh, they, they do without. Uh, they suffer because they don't have freedom. But freedom that we have in Christ is something that is really on an utterly different scale. And this is, as I've mentioned several times since I've started preaching here, uh, the collision really of the individualism of the American ideology and the call of the Christian community that we see in Scripture. And again, nowhere in Scripture does it say that Jesus needs to be our personal Lord and Savior, although I do think a personal profession of faith and public profession of faith on behalf of the individual is important. We have this concept and this idea that Jesus died for you and you alone, or me and me alone, that if there was nobody else on the planet, he would have died for us. I, I hate to tell you, but I've read through Scripture many times, and it doesn't say that. It's nice, you know, to, to think that Jesus really would have gone moved heaven and earth just for one of us, but we can't really speak to something the Bible doesn't speak to. And the reason we do speak to that is because our faith is very personal to us. I think our faith should be personal to us. I think the Bible teaches our faith ought to be personally valuable to us. It ought to be something that we call our own, that we grab onto, that we hold onto for dear life. When we consider what a life without Jesus would be, we personally are just wrecked inside thinking of what a life without Christ would be for us personally. That I have no problem with. The issue is that we begin to then think that we are the apple of God's eye as individuals. And Jesus died for the church. The bride is the church. I'm not the bride of Christ, and you're not the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Now, if Jesus wanted this to be done and emphasized on an individual basis alone, then all the teachings in Scripture would be talking about how you and I could have a better life now. We got plenty of people writing those books. We got plenty of people preaching those sermons. We got plenty of people writing those songs. What we don't have is a clear case in Scripture where you and I are the main concept of Jesus' affection. It's his church. It's the bride. That is why Paul, more than any other topic in all of his letters, talks about unity. That is why we are told if we want to be disciples, we have to first deny who? Ourselves. Right? But what do we do? We don't deny ourselves. We indulge ourselves. We define our own faith. We decide what freedom is going to look like for us and salvation is going to look like for us. And what do we do? We, we deny the church. If we, if we don't, can't give, we don't give. And if we can't go, we don't go. And if, if we don't want to hear about it, we go somewhere else. Right? It doesn't sound like we're denying ourselves. It sounds like we're denying the body of Christ. I mean, freedom is such an important concept for Christians to understand. Because it's in that freedom that you and I are ultimately, ultimately released for eternity from death. It's the freedom that we are given to know Christ in this life and into eternity. It is the freedom that gives us hope, that helps us to mourn with hope, that helps us to wrestle through the issues and the struggles of this life. That is what freedom does for us. But when we read the scriptures as only a personal love letter from God to me, I think we've really missed the whole concept. Imagine for a moment that someone who loves you dearly, let's just say it's even someone that's passed on before, but they wrote a letter to your family, and they address everything about your family, from when you should eat, and what you should eat, and when you should get up, and what careers you should all have, and you keep thinking it's only written to you. It gets really confusing when it starts talking about, uh, you, you know, the pastor, and the roles of the elder when you're not one. You understand the Bible's written for the church. God wrote it for all of us. So that you can understand what God expects of me. So can I can understand what God expects of you. So I can teach those things. So you can encourage me. So when we have an issue, we can come together and we can talk about it. And if we need to, we bring a witness. I mean, the whole thing is set up for the community of faith to function. But when we start to think about things individually, then the church starts to suffer. This is the case study. It's about food. 
Okay, we're Baptists, we love food. It's almost lunchtime, I know, you're gonna start smelling chicken, I get it. This wasn't food probably that we would have eaten, but it was food that was cheap. It was food that was good as far as no health issues with it. It was food that went around in the first century and it had been sacrificed to false idols, okay? And a person who didn't have a lot of money but also didn't want to eat something that was unclean, like from the dietary laws, would go and find in the marketplace food that had been sacrificed to idols. Why? Because if they were a Christian, it wouldn't have mattered to them. But to the Jews, it mattered. Gentiles didn't have all the regulations that the Jews had. And so the Gentiles would just go and buy whatever, right? It was one of the benefits they had. They could eat whatever, pretty much. No regulations. So when the church first started exploding, we had the 12 apostles who went out. Judas, of course, uh, committed suicide. And then Matthias came in. But they started going out and sharing the gospel, mostly all in Jerusalem. Why? That was their homeland. That's where their faith had started. That's where there was a plenty of lost Jews in Jerusalem. So they were sticking around Jerusalem. It was really not until the book of Acts where the apostle Paul gets blindsided by the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself knocks him down, blinds him, and says... I'm, you're going to be my light to the Gentiles. So Paul goes out after his salvation experience, and he tells them, this is what's going on. God wants me to go out, and, and the, the, the church in Jerusalem was like, go, go, you must go. But here's the problem. Gentiles started becoming Christians, and Gentiles became Christians without knowing the law, and without understanding the Torah, and without understanding that there were a lot of no-nos for Jews. And also, they didn't give a wit about Abraham or his covenant, or the fact that they were all supposed to be circumcised as males when they were born. None of this mattered to them. Why? They weren't Jews. So the Jewish Christians became upset with the Gentile Christians. Why? Because they weren't getting circumcised, and because they were eating all these unclean foods, and because they were going about doing life the way they did it. And you know what? They had points on some of this. Because the concept of marriage between a man and a woman was a very Jewish ideal. That was something they'd been teaching for centuries. It was not something the Gentiles thought about. Gentiles would go and worship. They would call a place a house of worship, and it was basically prostitution. They didn't understand what cleanliness and purity was when it came to the body. They didn't understand that the body was the Holy Spirit's temple. They didn't get that kind of stuff. And so you can imagine there needed to be a little bit of a, of a learning curve. But, so the, the Jews started complaining. These Gentile Christians aren't getting circumcised. They're eating whatever foods they want. They're fornicating and doing everything they used to do. And so they have a council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. They come together and they decide, how are we going to unify the church? Why? Because it wasn't about the individual. It wasn't even about the individual group of Jews or Gentiles. It was about the church. Read the whole New Testament with that in mind. And it will change the way you think about community. Everything you're talking about is for us as a body, for us to use to understand one another and function with one another. And so they come up with some ideas, okay? There, there was fighting there. There was going on and on. They decided, listen, Paul said, listen, I, I will tell you that Jesus himself called me to do this. And they're like, we have no doubt that Jesus called you to do this. We affirm the fact that our God is now the God of the Gentiles, that he, through Christ's blood, can save anyone but we got to put up some ground rules. And so they came up basically with two ground rules. Uh, one was flee from fornication. That was not debatable. That, that was clear in both covenants. The other was they said, don't eat meats or things that have been sacrificed or close to idols. And don't eat, don't mess with blood. Like, so a lot of it had to do with dietary and then some of it had to do with purity. The book of Rome comes around. Romans, the letter, to the church, they're having that same problem. It's about to split the church. They're about to house churches. And, as you would imagine, they're segregated into Jewish house churches and Gentile house churches. Why? Because people flock together, right? That's what birds of a feather do. They just go and they flock with the people they already agree with because it makes it a lot easier. If the preacher says something you don't agree with, you know, then, then you, you've got to leave, right? Because you can't actually be in a room with somebody who disagrees with you when you are the smartest person in the room. There is no smartest person in the room in the church. We're all enemies of God. We are desperate people forgiven by a gracious God because of his grace. That's it. There's no right people. There's only truth. And so they would debate among themselves 
You shouldn't be eating this. The Jerusalem council said this. The law said this. And Paul comes in and he says, as a Jew, I, I don't really care what the Jerusalem council said about that. Jesus is more than food. It was a bold statement for Paul to make. Paul was there when they made the decision. Paul accepted the decision, but when it came down to it and they tried to figure out what freedom was, he said, no, they don't have to be circumcised. They're not Jews. And number two, they can eat whatever they want because God made it all. It's a very bold statement. And if you understand then that this concept of freedom was something they wrestled with all the time, I think maybe it might be something you and I need to wrestle with as well. Do I have the freedom as an American to tell you exactly what I think about you and your family? Unless I threaten you, yeah, I do. As a Christian, should I? Ought I? And that's really what the Bible is trying to get us to think about. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to convict us to do. To do the thing that is best for the church. To do the thing that is best for the faith. Not the thing that is best for us. Again, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you go to offer something at the altar, and you remember that someone has something against you, you go and make it right. It doesn't say if you've got a problem with somebody, you better go talk to them and work it out before you try to worship. If I've got a problem with somebody, that doesn't mean I've got a problem with Jesus. It means i just got a problem with somebody. And I can either work through it, get over it, and forgive them like the Bible says, or, if I think it's a huge problem, I should probably go to them in humility and say, hey, can we talk? And if not, then move on. Right? Forget it and move on. If you can't forget it and move on, then yes, you should probably, as a brother or sister in Christ, go talk to a person. But that's not what Jesus was saying. What Jesus was saying was when the Spirit of God could fix you, that somebody rightly has something against you, you go fix it. If you've wronged a brother or a sister, you fix it. And if you can't fix it, then you shouldn't worship God. Because what you're doing is making that corporate act a personal act. Folks, the most intense spiritual moment of the week should be our corporate worship. But that corporate worship isn't going to be intense unless our personal devotion to Christ is daily and it's about denial. And that's why you go to Baptist churches and a lot of them are dead. It's not because the preaching is horrible. It's not because the singing is bad. It's not because they're singing out of the hymnal or they're singing off the screen. None of that. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the instruments. It has to do with the fact that people are not coming prepared to worship God in spirit and in truth. And people that are coming to worship God really don't care what book it's from. And they really don't care what instruments are being used. That's a personal preference. I have a personal preference. I'll tell you sometime if you want to know. I don't think you've ever seen any of some of the songs that I worship to. Doesn't matter. Why? Because this isn't in my time of worship. This is our time of worship. This is what we do as a community. So I say all that to set the stage for us to understand that freedom from the law doesn't mean freedom to do anything you want, but it also does mean that you have some freedom from traditions that have been set up because times change. And you know what? It's a lot harder for us to try to live in the balance of freedom in Christ than it is to just talk about it. Jesus set us free. That means we're truly free. Let's go down through this list, and we are going to get to John 8, but that's going to be number four. Number one, genuine, everlasting human freedom is a gift that God alone can give. Okay? Only God gives freedom. You can't get it anywhere else. Now, our military has given us as a nation the freedom to worship, right, in whatever way we want. The, the, the Constitution has given us certain rights and freedoms, right? I want you to understand that only Christ sets you free. It doesn't matter, okay? Should we appreciate the military? Absolutely. Should, should we be happy that we have law and order? Absolutely, we should. It, it is... is, is, is a little bit of an oppressive government, an invasive government, better than anarchy? In my mind, yes. Maybe not in your mind. You know what? We have the freedom to disagree on that. What we do not have the freedom to disagree on is the fact that Jesus is the one who truly sets us free. Now, what did Jesus set you and me free from? Ourselves. So the government's not our problem. You know, that group of people over there is not our problem. Washington, D.C. is not our problem. You know, we're our problem. 
When Jesus came to save us, he came to save us from our own sin, from the fact that we were enemies of his. And so always remember when you get freedom, it comes only from God, and it was setting us free from self. So again, when we feed into that individualism, that's beginning to erode away at that freedom we have. Number two, in a fallen world, a divine gift like freedom only comes through sacrifice. Nothing is easy. And I made that mistake when I was younger in my faith. I thought things were supposed to be easy. I thought if I prayed to the Lord and said, hey, God, what do you want me to do? Here am I, send me, that he really was kind of obligated then to kind of set me out like, you know, he did Samuel and say, I want you to do this. <laughs> or to Moses, I want you to do this. And you know what? That happened most of my life until about 15 years ago when I was at Prince Avenue. And I did. Ha I had no clue what God wanted me to do. And every Sunday I came and I preached and I did what I knew I had been called to do. I felt like I was kind of Joseph in the Old Testament. I was in prison. I was there for two years. And what do you do? You do the last thing God said. I didn't have the freedom to pack my bags. I didn't have the freedom to, to uh, readdress the problem. I didn't have the freedom to decide I wasn't going to be preaching anymore. He hadn't given me any of those freedoms, but he also wasn't giving me any direction. Here's another key concept I want you to write it to the side. Our freedom in Christ means that we are his bondservants. A bondservant is somebody who freely owes nothing more to the master, but says, I want to be his slave anyway. Jesus sets us free so that we can willfully and voluntarily serve him the rest of our lives. That's what he set you free for. Not so that you can go out and enjoy your life and do whatever you want. That's sin. Sin is doing whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. But what freedom in Christ means is that you and I can go out now and serve Christ. You know what that means? That means that somebody can wrong me and I can go on with my life. Somebody can break the rules. I can think somebody owes me the biggest apology that's ever been in the history of the world. Even bigger than the one that I gave Jesus. You know what? They won't give it. I move on. I have the freedom to move on. There are freedoms in the Bible that are complicated. Paul says if the unbeliever departs, let him go. Like, that's a freedom. That's a freedom you have as a Christian. But you're not free to just leave whoever you want to leave and break whatever bond you want to break and do whatever you want to do. You and I don't have the freedom to do that. I don't have the freedom to say no when God says go. I, I don't. And if God says give, I don't have the freedom to not give. Like, that's not my, my, my option. And I don't know how many Christians I've talked to, especially younger Christians, about tithing. And they're like, well, I'm just so far in debt. And I'm like, then tithe. <laughs> well, we shouldn't be in debt. Well, that's a different sin. But the Bible specifically says that if you will honor him with your first fruits, he will bless you. Why don't you go with that? Okay, I'm not saying don't pay debt. I'm saying you've got to figure out how to do both. You put yourself in a bind here. I've had people tell me they've married somebody they don't love anymore. I'm like, well, fall back in love with them. <laughs> Forgive them. Get some counseling. Talk about it. Well, I, I just, no, see, that's, that's you thinking about you. That's not me thinking about us. In the Bible, it's always me thinking about us. It's us thinking about each other. It's us carrying one another's burdens. God does this, and it has to be done through sacrifice. If you're not making significant sacrifices in your life that you can point to for people that you love and some people that you don't love that much, then I will tell you this. You're not a free person. You're not a free person. It's a small thing, but a little thing. Those of you who spend any time with me or have taken a ride with me in my car know that I hate my car. I don't hate it. I loathe it. I detest it. I despise my car. I don't, I don't want to ride the car anymore. I pick the car I want. I told everybody in my family I want the car. I still don't have the car. You know why? Because Linnea got a car. Linnea gets a car. Dad has a good car. You know what? I've never felt more free. And it's not because I love the car. It's because I, I feel like I'm giving my child something my child needs at the time. And I already have what I need. I mean, I have what I want. But folks, when it comes to choosing the next pastor, 
I don't really know. Yes, fill out the survey. Yes, be honest. But ultimately realize that the search team isn't here as major needs to fill your menu. They're just trying to figure out where the church is at. Realize that whoever God calls and whoever God puts before you, you are voting that person in so you will follow them. Okay? And that's, that's freedom. That's freedom. If you don't listen to teaching, you're not free. If you don't follow leadership, you're not free. If you don't love your, your, your wife as Christ on the church, you're not free. If you don't submit to the leadership of your husband, you're not free. No matter how free you think you might be, you're not free. Freedom comes through sacrifice. Number three, we can aid others in understanding freedom through the gospel by offering affirmation, forgiveness, guidance, and carrying one another's burdens, etc., etc., etc. Do you know why we like affirmation? Because it, 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 it's, 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 sense, it's a sense of freedom, isn't it? I wasn't sure if I was doing that right, but you know what? I think I might be doing it right. That, that's good. You know why? Because slaves, bond servants, are concerned with making the master in the household happy. That's why it's troubling when you have Christians who don't care what anybody thinks. Jesus cared what people thought, and he was the God of the universe. Now, he didn't let Peter talk him out of being crucified, but he, he, he did care. It startled him. He said, how can you have been with me so long? Get behind me, Satan. Why are you listening to the enemy right now? Like, what people think should matter to us. Good, bad, or ugly, it should matter. Affirmation is something that you can give a person in your freedom in Christ. It's something that can set them free. It's something that can help them. Out of all the things I've done and said in the ministry, that any job I've ever done, you know what surprises people the most is when I affirm them, because people aren't used to that. When I tell them I appreciate them. When I tell them I love them. I could stand up here and preach straight out of the book of Revelation and tell everybody they're going to hell. It wouldn't surprise them as much as me saying, you know what? I, I, I really love you. I care about you. And, and I, want, I want this to be right between you and Jesus. You and I have the freedom to do that. Now let's turn to John 8 real quick. We're going to look at verses 31 following down. This is an interesting chapter um, because Jesus has taught some things about he's the light of the world. Um, he, he has actually uh, set free the adulterous woman and uh, told her to go and sin no more. Talked about being the light of the world. Then he talks about the coming judgment. And then after he's talking about the coming judgment in 21 to 30. Um, and he said he spoke these things and many came to believe in him. Now, many who? Well, if you go back up a little bit, um, you, you see that he is really arguing a little bit uh, with Pharisees in, in the setting, but also he's teaching people. People are starting to follow him. He's gaining momentum. And so everything starts to get a little bit concerned. So Jesus then says to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Now I want you to underline the word if. It's the biggest little word in the Bible. And it's all over scripture. If. Okay? You're not a disciple because you say you believe in Jesus. You're not a disciple because you came forward and you got baptized. You're a disciple because you continue in his word. Well, I don't believe we're saved by works. I don't either. I also don't believe we're saved by stupidity or ignorance. What the Bible is very clear on is that we can't work our way to God. The Bible is also very clear on there's not a person that has existed in history that doesn't know Christ and refuses to follow him. If we're his disciples, we continue in his word, which means that we hold to his teachings, that we listen to what he says, that when there's the truth being spoken, we're convicted by it. He says, and you will know the truth, disciples, and the truth will make you free. So what sets us free? Well, Jesus did on the cross, obviously, right? But, but that hasn't happened yet. What he's saying is you have to understand everything that I'm offering to you as your Messiah, as your king, as your priest, as your savior. If you will know this, if you will abide in my word, you will be a free person. 
And sometimes freedom means that you've got to humble yourself below the carpet on the ground to go and repent when you've done something wrong. That's what freedom is. Freedom means that I care more about everything else that God is doing on this planet than I care about me. That's freedom. You know why he tells us not to worry? I know, I know, I've got worriers. We're all worriers. He tells us not to worry because that's us taking things out of his hand and the church's hand and putting it in our own. It's a battle for individualism. You know, I mean, I can understand if you did not hunt, you had to feed your kids. That's, that's a genuine concern. There's a difference between having a concern and just having worry. Worry is, is having emotions in your life that are messing you up and clouding you of things that you can't control and you don't need to control. You know, that's why we mourn, but we mourn with hope. We don't have to worry. We know that Christ is real, that salvation is real, and heaven is real. We understand this. It's not the end. We don't have to worry about death. But you know what? When you're sick and you have cancer, it's okay to be concerned. Death's a tough thing. It's okay to wrestle with how you're going to say goodbye and what life's going to be without this person. I mean, it's, it's human nature. But worry is something that puts us in bondage. He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I'm an enemy of Christ before I'm saved. That set me free. I am expected to deny myself every day. That sets me free. We have to forgive one another. It sets us free. I, I should be craving the word of God. If I'm not craving the word of God, I'm not intense enough about my faith. That truth sets me free. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He sets us free. So number four, God has chosen the truth as the agent of freedom. Truth is the agent of freedom. Now, when you and I as sinful humans are approaching one another with truth, we speak the truth in love, right? God always speaks in love. God is love. But you and I sometimes speak the truth in anger. The truth in anger is probably not going to set a person free, although the truth should set them free. That's why you and I have to pray about things and work with one another and forgive one another and love one another because the truth spoken in love is something that can actually give a person freedom. Number five, many people think they are free and they're not. Okay, Let's look at verse 33. They answered him and they said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will be free? Now, I just want to remind you a couple things. Um, Egypt... Babylon, any of this ringing a bell? This is a nation that was enslaved at least twice by major world powers that everybody in the history of the world knows, right? What did Moses do? Moses went and pulled them out. They said, we've never been enslaved to anybody. Like, that's what I love about God. He doesn't, he doesn't really rebuke us when we're just being dumb. Okay? Like, Jesus could have had a thousand answers to this. Like, um, have you guys ever heard of Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar or anybody? Daniel the prophet? Moses? Any of this ringing a bell? I mean, he, he wasn't doing that with them. Why? Because I don't think they were trying to fight with him. I think they're like, wait a minute. We're Jews. We believe what you're saying. We get it. It makes sense to us. We're, we're not going to fight with you, but we're Jews. We've never been in bondage. Do you know what the most troubling experience for a Christian should be on this earth? To try to work with someone you know is a bondage and they refuse to admit it. Because they're in a gilded cage. Because they're comfortable with where they're at. There's nothing else that they really want out of this world. Do you know how sad that is? That you really think this, this world has enough to offer you as an eternal being created by the one true God, this world has enough to satisfy you? I mean, what a sad, sad sentiment. Many people think they're free, and they're not. Number six, freedom gives privilege and protection. It gives privilege and protection. Jesus answers them and says, truly, truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Why? Because uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh didn't matter at this point. What mattered is they didn't think they were in bondage to their own behavior. Jesus really gets to the heart of the matter. He gets to the core of the apple here. 
He says, if you don't think you're in bondage, then you don't understand the law. Yeah. And what they had decided to do was tie themselves to the law, which couldn't save them. And none of them could follow the law anyway, but some of them falsely thought they were doing okay. He says, listen, you are a slave. You're a slave to sin because you commit sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains in the house forever. Number six, freedom gives privilege and protection. Privilege and protection. You and I are allowed to boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. You and I are allowed to live among the protection of the people of God. Think about the, the, the 99, okay? There's, there's two times Jesus says that. One time he's talking about the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. He follows that up with the ten coins, and then one's missing. They sweep the house, they find the coin. Then he follows it up with the sheep. Okay, there's 99. He goes and gets the one and brings it back. And then he goes to the prodigal son. The prodigal son didn't come home, and they couldn't find it. He had to come to his senses and come home. So Jesus was making an argument. You can find a coin, you can find a sheep. You can't find a person. The person has to be convicted. The person has to come to their senses, and the person has to come home. In another setting, Jesus does say, you know, I would leave my people, Israel, to go find the lost sheep. I would do that, okay? He makes that statement. But what he's, what he's trying to help us understand here is that it's, we have this privilege, and we have this protection. God knows you as his child. He understands you, the good, the bad, the ugly. And sometimes when we think about the privilege that we have in Christ, it's always the, he lead the whole world to come and find me. Again, that's a self-centered faith. Do you know what makes me feel good about my God? Is if there's a person I'm trying to reach and I can't, I know that God would walk away from me for a while to grab them. If, if he thought I was okay. So sometimes when God's ignoring you, it's not because he doesn't love you, it's because he thinks you're okay. He's wanting you to make some decisions. He's wanting you to wrestle through some ideas and some concepts. But we think if we just can't feel his spirit all the time, his presence all the time, he's abandoned us. He said he would never leave us or abandon us. Our assumption has to be as his children that he is right here next to us, that we are in his presence. And that perhaps there's other things that he needs us to work on right now without him having to hold our hands and walk us through it. There's a lot of steps in the sand. He doesn't carry us through all of life. You know, we have to be able to be mature in our faith to be able to make some decisions on our own. There's that privilege that is there. There's that protection that is there. Number seven, there is no greater freedom than in Christ. And look at what he says in verse 36. He says, so if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. And that's the kind of freedom that we want. That's why we formed as a nation. That's why we had a revolutionary war. Because we wanted freedom to worship God. We wanted to be set free by Him. And I think sometimes we get confused in our culture that somebody else is going to set us free. That some political party is going to set us free. That some certain theology is going to set us free. We thought as Southern Baptists, once the conservatives resurged and got rid of all the crazy liberals, that Jesus was going to set us free. I don't know if you've noticed, we're not free yet. We're still in bondage. We're still as fragmented as we've ever been. We just agree on theology now. That's how the enemy works. Maybe we, we have the enemies tagged wrongly. If Jesus said, listen, if they're rebuking demons in the name of Jesus, why are you yelling at them? If they're not against us, then they're for us, right? That's not the way we live our faith as conservatives. If they're not with us, they're against us. That sounds like a villain in a Star Wars movie. No, not Christianity. You and I have the faith to, to know right from wrong. We have the freedom to make some mistakes. And still be forgiven of them. What we don't have the freedom to do is shut ourselves off from everybody we disagree with and act like we can't have a conversation with them anymore. I grew up in a home where we loved Jesus. I grew up in a church that was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. These are not concepts I learned just from going to Sunday school. These are concepts I learned from getting to know people and realizing that everybody's at a different level. You know, Paul instructs 
Timothy, you have to be careful about how you understand people and their roles and what it is they're supposed to be doing. He tells us at the end of June, you've got to be patient with those who are doubting. This is a tough thing. Even the disciples themselves, right before the Great Commission was given, it said many of them doubted. They had no idea what was going on. They thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom, and he wasn't doing it. But you know what? We have the freedom to ask questions sometimes. And we ought not be rebuked for it. We, we ought to be encouraged that we're being brave. Life is hard on this planet. And anybody who's trying to live it for Christ knows that. Why don't we give each other some grace? Instead of just automatically, okay, well, you're not in our camp anymore. You're over there. We're enemies. It's not the way Jesus worked. It's not the way we ought to work either. Number eight, with freedom comes responsibility. The woman was caught in adultery earlier in this chapter, and she was told, go and sin no more. The man at the pool of Bethesda, same thing. I want you to skip down to the bottom. Galatians 5.1, it says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing, there's your blame, firm, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. You were a slave to yourself. You were a slave to the enemy who wanted to destroy you. Now you have voluntarily become a slave to Christ. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. What does he mean by freedom? Everything I've, just been, I've been saying. It doesn't mean that you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, though, that we have the privilege of seeking Christ and having him guide us through that process. Look at the next one, 1 Peter 2.16. At the very bottom, it says, Act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of Christ. It's exactly what the Bible teaches. Your freedom allows us to be slaves of Christ. And if you and I don't have freedom, we can't serve him. And that's really what it's all about. This is why we say this is the morning service. It's service to God. It's not service to each other or us. It's us as a community coming to give service and honor to God. You and I have freedom to do that because Jesus died on the cross. And he thought it was so important that we had that freedom that he died the most gruesome death known in the history of mankind. To allow us to pray to him. It's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Number nine, the freedom is being his child. You can look up Romans 8 later. Number 10, we are set free from something, and that is the law of sin and death. Why was the law bad? It wasn't bad. Paul says it's not bad. The law is good. The problem is people are bad, and they can't follow the law. So God is willing to give us the freedom from the law that we're not held to those chains anymore so that we can actually follow him. He will teach us the new covenant, which is a covenant of grace and not law. But all that stuff is still really important to know because it revealed who God is. So God has not set you and I free from moral obligation. We still have moral obligation. It's just it's not going to save us. The law can't save us. But he has set us free from that. Number 11, we are set free to do something. And I want to close with that. What are we going to do? I think I've told you plenty of times what it takes to be a disciple. You have the freedom to do that as a Christian. You have the ability to make that decision. You can make that happen in your life because Jesus opened up the path for that to happen. You live in a nation where men and women have died and shed their blood so that you can worship freely without the condemnation of the government. There is absolutely nothing except your wrong views, your falsehoods that are holding you from being free today. But the freedom that Christ offers is not you getting to live your best life. It's the freedom for you to sacrifice that life for him. Romans 12, and I'll close with this. Paul said, in light of these mercies, my brethren, let's offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because this is your logical worship. If we believe that Jesus has done this, the only logical thing to do is for us to return our lives, voluntarily become his bond slaves, and serve him with everything. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the tough teachings. Lord, even in the great benefits that you give us, Lord, you call us to do so much. Lord, there's so much good that is expected from us on your behalf. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to not grow weary in doing good. Lord, that you would help us to do it in your name and for your honor and for your glory. Speak to us now, Lord. Let us seek our freedom completely and utterly in you. We ask in Christ's name. Let's let's stand together as we take this time uh, to respond to the Lord, whatever He said to us. You can come and worship here at the altar. You can pray. You can pray with Brother Jeff. He's up front here. There's others that would pray with you. You can pray right where you're at. What is Jesus? Jesus paid it all and why he did that. 